handy as you could imagine. But there was more pressure during the rock pinnacle removal uh, because of the drought on the Mississippi than I ever felt was handy. In, in fact, and it started really fast because when I, I remember, you know, Sandy was October, end of October, into November. The drought effort started in December the same year. At the same time we had all this water in New York City, you know, had no water in the Mississippi. And I remember walking in the White House and I bumped into the president. And he, he knew I was the chief engineer and he, he doesn't know me that well, but, but uh, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, Mr. President, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, you know, we had drought on 67% of the country. And the drought's so bad on the Mississippi barge traffic, it's about to stop. And he looked at me and he said, you need to fix that. <laughs> I said, I could use some help. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I, I go into OMB and, and we say, you know, we're going to let a contract, we're going to work on this, and, and we'll be ready to go to work in February. And they looked at me in February, and I started explaining things. Well, we started work the next week. You know, long story short, we figured out how to get the contracts and let everything. And, and the team on the ground that did all that work was just amazing. Uh, but um, but it was the first time that I, I, I thought folks in the White House were realizing and understanding. Not that they're bad folks. I mean, there, there's a lot of priorities that are going on in the country. Um, uh, and, and, but they dropped everything. The OMB director, the White House chief of staff, they dropped everything. And this was, for that moment in time, the priority to get uh, the barge traffic moving because it's tied to the economy. And folks understood what that meant if, if the traffic stopped. So, so a huge effort. Um, I know that the Rock Island's also doing the Upper Mississippi River ecosystem restoration work. Uh, we've done a lot of work in partnership with um, the, the Interior Department, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, EPA, and, and I think that this work is really setting the stage. It's very important. It's a 25-year program that really looks to the future, and more importantly, it's been funded uh, to the tune of its full amount, fundable amount, in the last two years. So uh, $31.5 million, which is the maximum that we thought we could use in those years. Uh, so, so that's a good news story, and I think it says a lot about the Upper Miss and the work that the team up here is doing to try to move out in a very important area. In navigation, um, you saw by the videos up there, you know, most of the overseas trade, 98%, 1.4 billion tons of weight, and about $1.77 trillion uh, moves through the core projects uh, every year. Uh, the nation's harbors, channels, and waterways uh, handle a total of 2.3 billion tons, um, foreign and domestic, of commerce annually. It's just amazing. 60% of the nation's grain, 22% of the domestic petroleum products, 20% of the coal used for electricity, much of that nation's hydropower, as you saw, the fifth largest producer of electricity um, in the country. It's just amazing what happens uh, on the inland waterways. 48% of the consumer goods um, are, that the Americans buy pass through our harbors uh, that are maintained by the Corps. I was um, getting some training last week, uh, and generals still get training, so I was at GEO training uh, in my training was with FedEx and AutoZone, and, and we fortunately had to meet with the CEOs. So Fred Smith, who had this idea that you could FedEx things overnight, uh, he came and he talked to us for a while. And he was talking about FedEx and, and, uh, and how, how they've grown and what they've done and, and some of the things that they're trying to do to give back. They're trying to hire 10% of their workforce that want to be veterans. AutoZone's 47% veterans. Uh, but uh, when the question started, then, then I, I was like one of the senior guys getting trained. I was the only, there were only two, two, three stars. So I was one of the three stars. I think they picked us to kind of help mentor the group. The, the rest were two stars, SESs, uh, and sorry, majors. And so I asked uh, Fred Smith, I said, hey, you know, what do you see as your responsibility? I, I said, we're, we're a great country, but we're great because we get these two coastlines 
get the Gulf Coast, we get the Great Lakes, we get 12,000 miles of inland waterways, but we get a D plus for aging infrastructure, and nobody's doing anything about it. What's your role as a senior leader in our country? He said, I'm glad you asked. I was just with the president and, and the chamber, you know, he works with the Chamber of Commerce and others, and, and they were all addressing him on different things, but his point was aging infrastructure in this nation. He gets it, and from roads to rail, uh, to runways to rivers, he really gets it. So to have voices like that that are out there speaking on the nation's aging infrastructure, at first I was very surprised. I, I, I didn't know that he was that involved, but part of what we're all trying to do, I, I tell my guys it's like a punching bag, you know. You're not going to knock a punching bag out of me. You just keep punching at it. You just keep... You know, and, and you soften it up, and, and then, you know, something's going to break, and, and, and we're going to go over the top, and, and the nation will see the challenges and the issues that, that we face uh, as a country. But, but we're benefiting greatly uh, from it. We just got to focus on it. Um, in operations and maintenance, uh, we have 236 lock chambers, 192 sites, and nearly 60% of the locks have reached their design line. They're well beyond. Their, their economic design line. We have work to do. Uh, they average 52 service interruptions per day. So this is an unscheduled interruption. Sometimes it's a small interruption, like a few. Sometimes it's, you gotta stop traffic, you gotta bring the welders out, uh, and, and it's gonna be a few days. And, and those are really tough. Um, we think these unscheduled delays have imposed about a $33 billion in cost on U.S. products in 2010 and the cost is expected to increase. To maintain the existing level of delays that we're facing, uh, based on the aging infrastructure, we need $13 billion in cumulative investment uh, by 2020. And we think we're gonna have about seven billion uh, by 2020. So, so there's a gap in there that, that we know just in big number math, we cannot get there from here. And, and it's going to take a different approach, and it cannot all be federal. It's going to have to be state. It's going to have to be local. It's going to have, our private sector is going to have to get into the fight, and and, and it's going to we're going to have to have alternative means of financing. Public-private partnership is going to be very important in this. But we're at a D plus. That's what the American Society of Civil Engineers says uh, our grade is, and nobody likes it. We're 14th in the world in the quality of our infrastructure out of 144 different uh, countries. We're seven slots lower than we are. We were in 2008 and we're going down. So we, we have got some work to do. Uh, we've got to talk to the American public and make them aware. You know, when I became chief engineers, um, just like when I became the G1, General Sullivan, who's the president of AUSA, he calls the three and four stars over and he's like, you know, um, he, he's like the father of a lot of us. And he kind of puts his arm around our shoulders and tells us, you know, what we need to do. Uh, in fact, uh, when I showed up there as the G1, I was there, um, they, he actually brought General Vono in. So it was General Vono and Sullivan. I think they knew what I was going to ask because they set me up. They said, hey, Tom, what can we do to help you? So what do you work on? What's hard? They said, well, sir, you know, I helped grow the Army. 45 to 570, and now we're drawing down the army. In fact, uh, it's going to be pretty hard, sir. In some years, we're going to have to draw down 15,000 soldiers in, in those years, and, you know, it's going to be tough on our army. I don't know how we're going to do it. And he goes, yeah, Ed, that, that is, that, that really does sound tough, Tom. And John Fono said, you know, Tom, I had a plan to draw down the army about 100,000, 125,000. We're going to do it 25,000 or so a year. And uh, then Desert Shield, Desert Storm hit, and um, and we didn't we didn't do anything. We didn't draw down anyone. Uh, and then Sullivan came in, and you know the new new administration came in, and they looked at General Sullivan and said, "Draw down the army a hundred thousand in one year." So tell me again what your problem is. <laughs> <laughs> That's General Sullivan, and, and you know, but he's a great American and. So anyway, I go in as chief engineers, and he said, now, Tom, what am I going to do to help the Corps of Engineers? I said, sir, water. You can help us with water resource management, talk about the importance of water and the management of water. And, and he, he did that. He brought 
the Institute of Peace, he brought the whole national security apparatus, and he brought the Corps of Engineers of the State Department, and we all talked about water and water security and, and water resource management and the history of water resource management in our country and, and, and where we're at now and what we need to do. Uh, he called me up later and he said, hey, I'm going up to Norwich and I need to speak to the students up there and I think I'm going to talk about water. I said, really? <laughs> Great. He said, I want to talk about climate change too, climate change, adaptation, and water. So we sent Dr. Kate White, one of our best experts in water resource management and climate change adaptation. He went up there and he hit a home run. And then he won the SAME, Society of American Military Engineer, Golden Eagle for National Security. He called up and he said, I want to talk about water. And uh, so we sent John Peabody, Eddie Belk, uh, and some of our great civil works experts over there. And he went up there and he accepted this award. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, where did Jim Sullivan learn this? And why is he doing it? And He's doing it because he cares, and he thinks this is an important area for him to focus on. And then he told me to get back to the Pentagon and make sure those guys understand it. Because when he was growing up as chief, he wasn't, he, he wasn't as engaged in this particular area as he is now. And he sees the importance now. And, and he told me he thinks he can be a spokesperson uh, for aging infrastructure. In fact. He's talking about water as aging infrastructure. Water is something in and of itself that you have to watch and, and talk about. So we've got a great advocate there. He went on the motor vessel Mississippi and um, he met with constituents and, and he rode up and down the Mississippi to just get a feel for what the local people, local businesses, local congressional offices coming in and talking about uh, the importance of the inland navigation flood risk management, ecosystem restoration. So, so we couldn't have a better advocate. I'm just really proud of him, and I'm thankful for uh, what he has done. Now, all of that said, the current situation is we're in a no earmark environment. Uh, we fund too many studies, and our projects, uh, or too many of them are funded, so we get less productivity. Uh, we don't accomplish things in a timely fashion because we're trying to do too much with too little, um, and that has led to civil works transformation. And civil works transformation, in, in a nutshell, it's really transforming our, our business processes, including how do we budget, how do we plan, um, how, how do we improve methods of delivery, and how do we manage our assets. First, we had to inventory our assets, because we frankly didn't, at the national level, know all of what we had. And now Congress has asked us to come back to them this year with a list of $18 billion worth of projects that we should divest of, that, that we can't do everything, uh, and we can't be everything to everybody. So, so we're creating that list of 18 projects that we're going to divest ourselves of, and we're going to work with the local community, and that will leave more resources for the projects that we're going to focus on. Uh, some examples of uh, great work that uh, is going on in Rock Island, the Americans Watershed, America's Watershed Initiative is a partnership alliance representing both the public and, and the private sector interests from 31 states that are seeking solutions to ensure the Mississippi River and the tributaries remain viable for future generations. Uh, we're creating a report card uh, that will help provide Americans with a complete picture of the health of the entire Mississippi River and its tributaries from Pennsylvania to Montana and Minnesota to Louisiana. The report card will help us move forward to develop a roadmap that will help pave the way for improvements and long-term sustainability of our Mississippi River and all of its tributaries. Uh, we're also extremely pleased to partner with the Nature Conservancy in a broader way um, as we look at sustainable rivers, uh, that sustainable rivers program, by selecting the Des Moines River uh, and putting that into the program. The Sustainable Rivers Program provides a framework uh, for a partnership with a common vision for maximizing the environmental benefits uh, from water uh, flow management. And the Des Moines River is one of the most impacted rivers in the United States, and therefore this Sustainable Rivers uh, Program 
who is unique in that it relies both heavily on uh, expert opinion and existing research to move quickly towards potential solutions. So I think this is a, a great opportunity for the Corps to help lead in this area with the community and make it make a difference. Um, I want to uh, start to close out here just by talking about one of the other areas that's important to the Corps, and that's um, how we get ready for our future. And this is uh, the people that we recruit, um, whether they're interns, um, whether they're um, experts from other fields, but, but we need a pipeline of talent. It's always about people for the Corps. We've got very talented folks. I often say we've got 40 percent that could retire today uh, or in the next several years, 40 percent that have 10 years or less and about 20 percent right there in the middle. So, so the baby boomers that, like me and others are going to move on and it's going to be important that we retain the talent, that we recruit the talent uh, and that some of that talent is, is science, technology, engineering and math talent. We're STEM talent. So we're going to elementary schools and middle schools and high schools and encouraging young men and women that if they're interested in math and science